I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump I back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample-tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 213. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, mm -hmm, we'll mm -hmm. be discussing Peter Jackson. Yes, we will. Kind of a prolific guy. Uh, great career, mm -hmm. very interesting, diverse uh, breadth of work, if you will. I would say diverse is de with the exception of, you know... His... Everything from Middle Earth. Yeah. Yeah. I That's mean, a little bit focused. But other than that, yes, definitely diverse. Why diverse? And even if you just consider... Middle Earth in relation to everything else, still very diverse. Sure. So very talented guy, nevertheless. Yes. But you know, we got a lot to discuss. Mm -hmm. uh, his first film, Bad Taste, we're not going to really touch upon. Yes. Sort of an interesting little cult classic. Yes. If please see it. Yeah. I mean, we'll he's talk. got he's got it on DVD, we'll or talk. you could get it at Scarecrow. Yeah. So good times there. Mm -hmm. Let us know in the comments what you think of it. But yes. we're going to start off with one of the more unique, perhaps, mm -hmm. films that he worked on. Yes. And that is Meet the Feebles. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Meet the Feebles. I guess you would describe it as a parody of the Muppets. Oh uh, yeah, or Triple X Muppets. That's but the way I like to it's, describe don't it. Don't you remember the original Muppets was like Muppets, Sex and Drugs, or something no, yeah. like that? So it, yeah. perhaps it's closer to being like a continuation <laughs> of the original Muppets. Yes, but I, whether or not you know Peter Jackson was fully aware of that, considering most people weren't aware of it until relatively recently. Heck, we just found out about it. What this year? I think that there even was an adult. That they yes. adult, Muppets is yes. an adult. I like to call it just like X-rated uh, Muppets is the way I like to look at it. Um, all puppets, no real humans used. There's humans in suits, but no actual human characters. All puppets. Let me all let me time. give this sort of brief description for mm, people if yes. they're wondering what exactly you mean by triple X Muppets. Yes, Heidi. The star of the Meet the Feebles Variety Hour discovers her lover Bitch, um, Bletch. Sorry, yes, Bletch. The walrus is mm -hmm. cheating on her and. With the world all waiting for the show, uh, uh, sorry, and with all the world waiting for the show, mm -hmm. the assorted, assorted co-stars must contend with their own problems. These include drug addiction, extortion, robbery, disease, drug dealing, and even murder. Mm -hmm. While this is happening, the love between the two stars is threatened by the devious Trevor the Rat, who <laughs> wishes to exploit the young starlet for use in his porno movie business. Oh yes, plenty if of sex. That doesn't sound triple X y enough for you. <laughs> uh, I don't know what you're looking yeah, for. Yeah, I think what that rat is actually uh, taping fetish porn in the in the basement of the of the um, stage where they're doing the the Feebles variety, variety hour. Yeah. So totally like the Muppets because they had their variety hour. Uh, yeah, really strange, disturbing movie. Deals with some pretty heavy issues. There's a guy who's a Vietnam vet with flashbacks. There's somebody who gets AIDS. I mean, I would uh, say, you know, if you look back on his career, in the early years especially, Peter Jackson was not afraid to um, court controversy. Oh, yeah. Because like, Bad Taste is about aliens who eat humans. And it's really bad special like effects. Like, he, he really was not trying to just play mainstream, mm -hmm. general pop yes. entertainment-y type stuff. I think Wingnut Films is a good name for his production now. Still, he's a still little, does that to this day, even on The Hobbit. So. A little bit crazy in the head. Um, I remember when I saw Meet the Feebles, it was at my hometown's version of Scarecrow. Hmm. It was like the small, but in this case it was like the small independent cult store that had mm -hmm. all the weird stuff you've never heard of in sure. imports. And I remember this being a film that when I saw it, I was told that I would be shocked. And I thought that... that You're like, I can't be shocked. Yeah, and this, which is funny because this was pre-Google, so it's like how much I've got shocked after that right, is yeah. unknown. But it's shocking, and it's gratuitous. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, in terms of, like, concept, mm -hmm. I love the idea. Like, it sounds <laughs> awesome, but... In terms of like entertainment value, like it's it's more of like an interesting concept. Oh no, no, you're wrong. Totally entertaining. Love I mean, the it's, meet it's, the feebles. It's entertaining, <laughs> but you you think about it in terms of like it's it's it is tough to watch. Like it is is not is not like it's, it's not watch. light. It's not light. <laughs> oh, it's not light, but it's not tough to watch. It's entertaining to watch if you're sick and morbid like me. I that's really what I'm hitting upon. Okay. Like I, I, I it definitely. 
is such a unique and interesting idea <laughs> yeah. that like somebody actually executed. Like you could hear <laughs> yeah. somebody propose this idea and you'd be like, "There's no way they're gonna make that." Yeah, I will. Yeah, and and they can. The movie continues to shock you the entire time. It's not like they pull them all out in the beginning and then you get used to it and then no. you just go it's, along with the it, ride. It really, it really, it pushes <laughs> those boundaries. Is really what I'm trying mm-hmm. to say. And. It's it's I respect it for that, but you know I like I, I you you look at it from like a career perspective, mm. and obviously it didn't hurt him. Yes, but you almost wonder like, could something like that have done damage to his career? Because it's it is I want incredibly more provocative. It. Like, I'm surprised that it didn't that a lot of people didn't go out and watch it after the Lord of the Rings movies, looking up his films. I but. wouldn't be surprised if they did actually. Uh, but uh, we should also note that Francis Walsh yes worked on this with. Peter Jackson mm-hmm. as a was a co-writer at yes. least this one, and Francis Walsh Stick is someone around. who has worked with him everything since mm-hmm. then, including The Hobbit. So I th- I think it's also interesting to note because it's you know it's a, it's a weird low budget film that when it was shot it was shot on shot on standard sixteen millimeter color film stock which actually has a TV monitor aspect ratio of four three, mm. and so on VHS and DVD editions that look like they're pan and scan are actually legit full screen. That's what it was, yeah. Yeah. I also it's... love that one of the aliens from Bad Taste is in the audience when they show audience shots from the film. Yeah, it's a funny thing about this film. I mean, I saw this film... It had to be before the Lord of the Rings came out, actually. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, it was a I, fr- I probably a friend saw this with before the Frighteners. Well, the first film I saw of Peter Jackson's, the next one we're going to talk about, mm-hmm. Dead Alive. Yes. That was the first one of his that I saw. Mm-hmm. And... You know, I think it's probably a fairly easy one. You think about, like, Meet the Feebles being Mm -hmm. the one before this. Yes. Dead Alive is graphic Mm -hmm. in terms of, like, blood. Yes. But it's a fairly... Solid movie. Like Solid movie, but it's, it's also just like an, it's a much more digestible thing to like a general person. Ah, like if yeah. you if That's you're just like a modest film. Yeah. horror film fan, mm-hmm. like it's got you know humor to yeah, it. It's true. It's it's got sort of like it's not super scary, mm-hmm. so it's not going to turn you off that way. It's it's outrageous, definitely oh, yeah. outrageous. I mean, using a lawnmower as a death tool mm-hmm. at the end is Which one I, of the uh, most memorable. Used, uh, they were pumping blood, movie blood at five gallons a second. It, I mean, it, it's one of the most memorable scenes I've ever seen <laughs> film, and that's one of the reasons why I remember seeing it mm-hmm. first mm-hmm. is because of that scene. But it's, it, I think it showed sort of the light-hearted sort of comedic spirit that there is to Peter Jackson's mm. films, and that yes. he's not all just like serious. Oh, yeah, obviously, me, always obviously, Meet the Feebles is crazy yes. and humorous and whatnot, yes. but this, like, Meet the Feebles is almost so outrageous it has to be put in its own <laughs> category because it's it's almost like provocative for the sake of being provocative. I would love to hear this art. You revisit this argument after seeing Bad Taste. I mean, I'm not, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying Bad Taste isn't the same no, way. No, I, no, it's just because it's it's entertaining to me because I saw Bad Taste first, and after that, everything else has merely seemed like par for the course. Even Meet the Feebles, which shocked me. I mean, I, 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 think, I think this was the first film, though, if you ask me, that it really showed he could be a director that could entertain a wider audience. Yes. Meet the Feebles, I feel like is entertaining, but it probably turns off a lot of people. Like, it's it's outrageous, it's provocative. Dead Alive isn't necessarily provocative. I mean, it's it's graphic in terms okay. of the amount of blood, okay. but it's Fair it's enough. it's it's a much lighter film, I think, in okay. terms of being readily watchable. To I, I was like 13 or something when I saw this movie, and I was yeah. like, okay, this this doesn't bother me. <laughs> yeah, like to say the least. When, maybe uh, that says something about how me. much later was Dead Alive than three years. Oh, okay. So it probably took a while to get to get it going. Dead Alive, which is also called Brain Dead, so you might notice that. Um, Interestingly enough, the final scene of excuse me, the final scene of the film is where they pumped five gallons of blood mm-hmm. a second, not the lawnmower scene. Uh, that final scene almost also used three hundred liters of fake blood, which I find awesome. interesting. And I remember one of the things I always loved about Dead Alive, which is a story about the dead coming back, essentially, based on an infection from a rat monkey. Right. Uh, and it's spreading in New Zealand. Uh, one of the things I always enjoyed about that film is that they the lawnmower scene was like the first scene they shot mm, for the film 
to use to and they used their entire budget that they were planning for the film on that one awesome. scene so then they literally only had that scene and they had to go around and try to get producers with that scene and be like look we can make the whole movie just check it out I mean, I think uh, sort of to lead credence to my sort of mm. belief that it sort of became his first more most or er, first sort of glimpse that mm. he could do general work instead okay. of just like fringe crazy stuff okay. was that Dead Alive might not have been a huge award winner or anything mm. worldwide, but it really cemented his place in New Zealand film. Oh like, my god, yeah. Like if, if you, I think if if at the time it came out when ninety two, I'm trying yeah. to remember what other, I was just reading this today. I should have put it in here. Uh, if you counted like the per, the re relative popularity of it in New Zealand, it was like more popular than like Terminator. Well, you think about this, like it won Best Film at the New Zealand Film and TV Awards. Mm. It won Best Male Performance, mm -hmm. Best Director, Best Screenplay, Best Contribution to Design, hmm. aka Special Effects. Yeah, like because all the if you see it, all the the uh, trolley cars that exist didn't exist anymore in New Zealand, but they did in the time when they made it, and so it's all miniatures. No, it's just like, it, like this was the one that everyone was like, okay, this guy, mm -hmm. there's something to him. <laughs> we should we should start paying attention because this guy is a creative guy. Yes. No doubt Meet the Feebles is creative, mm -hmm. but this was one that was sort of like, okay, look, this is something we can perhaps be a little bit more proud to throw out to the world. I, I guess I can agree with that. Like, it's, it's just a little bit more... Um, of a card to show people. Like, I think it's an interesting statement to show with how clearly bad taste and Meet the Feebles have to be pet projects of yeah. Of oh Peter sure. Jackson. I mean, he's a very writer director guy, yeah. in it, you know. And then you get to, to Dead Alive, and that's obviously still very much a pet project of his. But I think it's interesting that there's not a single uh, cut from Peter Jackson's original screenplay. Everything that he originally wrote was filmed. So, I mean, just thinking about that as far as, like, a, a writing perspective blows my mind because that yeah. means he wrote it paced out in a way that it didn't need to be cut up afterwards. It wasn't like, we need to lose the scene for pacing. Nope. Eh, I mean, you're any filmmaker, efficiency is the king. So. <laughs> yes. I, it was just great. But, you know, I think, you know, he, he really started... I think his development is one of the most clear paths you can search. Mm -hmm. You know, you think Meet the Feebles to Dead Alive, and then you yes. think Dead Alive to Heavenly, Heavenly Creatures, Creatures mm -hmm. which went from like, you know, okay, you know, Meet the Feebles might be the fringe. Yes. Dead Alive is still a little bit in the fringe, yeah, but a little a bit more movie, mainstream. First time horror movie. So. But Heavenly Creatures is like flat out just like this is, I mean, it's a dark subject matter yes. about two girls who kill one of their mothers. Yes. It's dark, but like it is a seriously engaging drama, and mm -hmm. that's something that pretty much would be more, oh, even more mainstream in terms yeah. of like the audiences it might appeal yeah, to. Yeah, and I think one, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, it might have been um, Francis Walsh uh, who actually brought the I had been obsessed with the story of these two girls yeah, from Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume yeah and uh had been obsessed with it and kind of like suggested that Peter Jackson take it on as his next project not only because she was so interested in it but because she was like you know you're really good you should try to actually make something that shows how good you are and so I mean I, it's uh Kate Winslet's first film. Yeah, the, like that's the funny thing is you're watching the credits yeah. and you're like, okay, I know Melanie Linsky yeah. and Kate Winslet star, and they both get introduced yes. in credits yes. at the very end of the credits. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh my god, wow. Yeah. Like Kate talk Winslet about... was like one of uh, 175 kids who tried out, and I think uh, Melanie Linsky was found by the casting director who was scouring local schools to find somebody that looked like hmm. uh, the original Pauline Parker. And it, I mean, this is also the first time I think he really started to get worldwide oh, yeah. acclaim because he got nominated for an, uh, he and Fran Walsh got nominated for a, a screenplay award at the Academy Awards in 1995. Wow. And do you know who they lost to? Mm -mm. Quentin Tarantino. Ooh. That's tough. You yeah. Know? And was that uh, Roger been, Avery. Was that Pulp Fiction, right? It was, yeah. yes. Okay. So, you know, if you're losing to Pulp Fiction, that's a very respectable yeah. person to lose to, you know? Yeah. Not too shabby there. But, you know, you got that. You know, he won an award at the Toronto Film Festival mm -hmm. for it. And, in, again, the New Zealand Film Awards. It won Best Actress for Melanie Linsky, mm -hmm. won Best Supporting Actress for Sari Paris, uh, won Best Foreign Performer for Kate Winslet, Best Director, Best Film Score, Best Editing, Best Design, Best Contribution to Design, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I think... Uh, yeah. 
I, I brought this up a little bit off camera, but I, I think I have a better, a little bit better of a explanation of it. Uh, this film is oftentimes cited as the example as to why the studios allowed Peter Jackson to do Lord of the Rings, mm. and I think maybe the, the these tidbits might help in why what part of that aspect it helped the studios, and I think that is his attention to detail and accuracy, yeah, because. Almost all the locations used for filming were the genuine locations where the events actually occurred. Uh, the tea shop where Honora Parker ate her last meal was knocked down a few days after the shoot ended. Like, wow, that close. And according to Peter Jackson, they actually went to the location where the murder itself occurs and, like, birds stopped chirping and it got really quiet, so they moved a couple hundred yards down because they were creeped out about it. I don't blame them. And then, as it says in the beginning of the film, but it's also, just to reiterate, uh, all of the voiceover, journal voiceovers are... Because she, she writes in a diary. Yeah, she receives a and, diary for Christmas early into the two girls being friends. And that's sort of one of the ways they end up catching her. Yes. Is that they, yes. they find her diaries really thoroughly documented. Yeah, because all the journals are direct voiceovers that are real diary entries made by Pauline Parker. And the characters in the stories, if not, and, uh, if not the stories themselves, and the make-believe world are also all authentic. All the like fake characters they come up with, all their little imaginary world, that's all legit from the diaries which are found like the day after the murder <laughs> it's i mean it's interesting i think it might have even been the same day like the afternoon of the murder or oh yeah you're like right because she was arrested that day and uh juliet Leo amusingly was, uh, they only the spent next day. five years in jail for mm -hmm. this um yeah. because they were considered minors yeah so. julia hume was on parole for an additional like six years right but. or she was stuck in new zealand oh yeah she yeah. was and they were never allowed to speak again mm -hmm. who knows if that, that would actually end up happening yeah. but yeah. um probably not I, who knows how would you monitor that i don't know um but you know it's sort of an interesting story just watch sort of the play between the two characters and mm -hmm. sort of like try and judge who deserves more accountability between them in terms mm. of the murders because you know initially it really feels like kate winslet is the driving yeah. force then it sort of becomes uh melanie linsky yes. is driving the one she's the one who first decides that killing the mom is the way to go mm -hmm. and kate winslet seems a little bit reluctant mm -hmm. to do it when they're actually doing it but then there's a moment where like they're like smashing the woman's head and she just picks up the the rock and sort of takes over and you're like okay maybe she's not really yeah. so opposed either so yeah and i mean for and uh, you know it, it's also interesting peter jackson decided he didn't want it to be a crime drama about who did it and he wanted it instead to be more a historical look back oh, at, totally. at the events i mean occurring. it only occurs in like the last five minutes they actually kill her yeah like which is also in the very first minute or so well they run out and they're like well, i'm just saying it, it the film starts pretty much after the murder and then yes. goes back yes. to when they first met yeah. great movie though yeah really good film one of my favorite films Peter Jackson's though is his transition to America if yes. you will and this is the one that I mean was his first I guess you would say bigger budget mm -hmm. I mean he went from like four million I think for five million for heavenly creatures to 30 million yes for the Frighteners. The yes uh, I love this movie this is story of a guy who sees dead people mm -hmm. ghosts all the time uh, not he's not dead though no. like he had a near-death experience and it gave him the ability to see ghosts yes. and so Rather than, you know, do what most people would do. Uh, oh, excuse me. He does exactly what normal people would do. He tries to bank on it. Mm -hmm. And he turns himself into essentially a fake uh, psychic. Yes. He makes it appear that the ghosts that he can see and talk to are haunting a place. And then he goes in and gets rid of them for money. But then actual weird stuff starts occurring well, then, that then, only he can notice. Yeah, then there's a ghost serial killer. Yes. And essentially the only one who can stop him is yes. Michael J. Fox. I think it's interesting that uh, his special of Peter Jackson's special effects company, if this tells you anything about everything they've done up to this point, including Meet the Feebles, Dead Alive, they had exactly one computer before this movie, and they went to 30 after uh, d during the creation of this movie. It makes sense. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's definitely, I mean, it's, it's such, like, to give you sort of a vibe of it, let me just say Danny Elfman was yes. the composer on the film. Speaking of Danny Elfman, Danny Elfman was so impressed with Heavenly Creatures that he offered to do the score for one of Jackson's next movies and agreed <laughs> to this movie without even knowing what it was about, simply because it was Peter Jackson's next film. Maybe he should have waited to Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I don't think he should have, because I think, <laughs> no, I honestly, even though been... The Frighteners is a bomb, unfortunately. No, no, I'm just joking, because yeah. that was like, like the Lord of the Rings trilogy made like $3 billion or something like that. I'm, I'm just saying, I can't imagine Peter, or sorry, Danny Elfman doing the score to it, but yeah. you know. And, and I think Danny Elfman doing the score to The Frighteners is one of the things that sells it. There's something about the Danny Elfman like quirky score that yeah, just it hits fits. The, the quickie, it fits, but for films. me, it's just like 
Michael J. Fox mm-hmm. as Frank Bannister is so perfect in that role. And he kept flubbing his lines, calling people Doc. It's just, it's he's so pitch perfect mm-hmm. in that role, and it's so perfectly quirky as it's not too quirky. Yes, but it's still strange enough that you can fit someone like Jeffrey Combs. Yeah, in fucking as a, has the reanimator in it, dude. As Come a supporting on. role, and it's still. It still makes sense. I mean, you got you got a great cast. I mean, mm-hmm. D. Wallace yes. is essentially one of the main villains, mm-hmm. which is a trip. The mom from E.T. being mm-hmm. one of those. Of and Jake Busey. Jake Busey being the other one, mm-hmm. a dead one in this case. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just, it's so well cast, not simply on a fame sort of mm-hmm. scale, but it's just, I think it's a really fun film, and it's got a nice little dark vibe to it, but yes. it's still just a fun film, I think. It, yeah, it was a lot of fun, I think, and it, uh, I think it's interesting that this is what kind of brought Michael J. Fox back from mm. just almost semi-obscurity. It was after this that he decided to go do uh, Spin Sin City. City, or Spin City, yeah. Because yeah. he was like, oh, I need to be in more stuff. This was fun. It's, and even still to this day, I think this is one of my favorite things he's oh, done. Oh, it's just so good. I don't know I, I don't know why... I don't know. It must have just been bad timing. I don't know why this movie no. wasn't an amazing Yeah, hit. I mean, maybe. I really still have a hard time but it, understanding it. It feels it. like, you know, this is one of the ones that... And we can get into this with The Lord of the Rings, where it's just <laughs> sort of like... It really focuses on the fun spirit of his earlier yes. work, whereas his later yes. work starts to focus so much on accuracy yes. and thoroughness that it sort of it doesn't really achieve that light funness that I would agree. perhaps is earlier. Or at least as much. Yeah. I also find it entertaining to know that Melanie Linsky and Kate Winslet are visible on the cover of the serial killer video that Lucy watches, recreating <laughs> a famous photo of their characters from Heavenly Creatures. That's funny. That's awesome. I like those carryovers, all that yeah. stuff. Because, I mean, you know, he's got the bad taste alien and meet the feebles, and there's, who knows, there's probably something weird and puppety and dead alive. And sort of like the, rat the monkey newest carousel. universe or yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we have to talk about the big yeah. elephant in his career, Lord of the Rings. Yes. I mean, we'll, we'll talk under the guise of Fellowship of the Rings, yeah. but we'll probably touch upon them all. Yeah. Um, I never read... The I was talking about this with someone the other day. I've never read the Lord of the Rings mm. books. I can see a lot of time. I don't everybody even, walks places. I I had I had, I, had, I was a fan of the Hobbit mm-hmm. though. I had I mean a book on tape, the animated movie, all that stuff. Uh, I was yeah, a big Ralph fan Bakshi, of. Bakshi. Yeah, Bakshi. Um, but I don't even know if I knew about Lord of the Rings until hmm. they released the trailers for him. It was like, oh, he did more stuff in Middle-earth. That's cool. Like, I don't even hmm. know if I was really aware of it until that point. And, you know, it's sort of interesting we're talking on the way over, just about the way the studio really gave... I mean, yes. obviously he was committed to making these projects, but, mm-hmm. you know, before that, his biggest film was $30 million budget. Yeah. And for New Line to basically risk the entire studio on $270 million budget for three films mm-hmm. was kind of an amazing investment. Obviously, you know, the Lord of the Rings and J.R.R. Tolkien are going to be- built an audience, yes. but to spend that much money on three films is a really big films. gamble. Yeah, Three long films, as we looked back. Yeah. The first one, this is not even the director's yeah, the, uh, yeah. First one was a two, min- two hours and 58 minutes. Yes. Second one was two hours and 59 minutes. Yes. And the third one was three hours and 21 minutes. So they're all and, essentially three hours and over. And like the original cut, obviously, put a lot of stuff This is the original cut, yeah. But the original, like the original non cut of just Fellowship was like four hours and 27 minutes. <laughs> like the pre edited, pre extended, like <laughs> just, hey, we filmed everything. Um, some of the stuff that's just crazy is like the level of scale. Because, you know, they filmed them all simultaneously. And it was uh, back-to-back, shoot, lasted a record 274 days uh, in 16 months. Exactly the ta- same time taken for the principal photography on Apocalypse Now, which is kind of sad. Yeah, that is sad. Uh, which is why Heart of Darkness is way more interesting than yeah. Apocalypse Now. Um, but I, the, the scale and the scope of some of the stuff, like, normally... Uh, you have like you know it's not weird to have like third or fourth unit directors. Mm-hmm. This movie had like seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth unit directors, and normally you have people like coming in looking at dailies, like thirty second, thirty minute dailies. Yeah, there was like four hours worth of dailies every day. They had extra units of directors looking through the dailies because they were making so they were just yeah. filming everything they could I, nonstop. I mean- it, like it's, I mean, it speaks to it. You know, the series is kind of interesting in terms of like the critical response. Mm-hmm. Like Fellowship, 
obviously everyone was like, oh my god, I can't believe this is being done. Yes. And so they got nominated for like, I think it was like 13 Academy Awards or something. Only one visual effects, music, makeup, and cinematography. Mm -hmm. But it was still nominated for like Best Director and Best Picture. Lost mm -hmm. to Beautiful Mind and Ron Howard for both of those, yes. which is kind of interesting. Yeah, it is. Um, but then, you know, like, ta Two Towers, like, dropped. And yeah. I think it was only nominated for like six seven awards yeah it didn't get much and i think it still got best picture which it lost to chicago but um i'm not a musical person so i'm like <laughs> but like he was he was chicago. he wasn't nominated like for your, best director or i just whatever. like your scorn That's he all. wasn't nominated for best director it it won best effects again no mm -hmm. surprise there but yeah. you know that was the throw more or less it like and then it comes back for return of the king and it comes like and wins Everything. Oh, everything. I think 13 awards or something yeah. for that one. So it's sort of this weird sort of like up and down mm -hmm. hierarchy of it. And, you know, it's funny to think back. I mean, what are your sort what was your take on the three films? Which ones do you rank sort of in order? I think I, I honestly feel like it's it's it, it fits in line for me with most classic uh, trilogies, which is the first one is the best by itself. The second one to me has the most interesting things happen. And the third one has all the wrap up and is okay and is good because it ends it, but this isn't necessarily the best segment of it. It's the same way I feel about Star Wars. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, it goes I, I could see two, that. one, three. That's the order that you go in the in the favorites. And that's not. And I don't even have problems with the with the multiple endings and the th of Return of the King. I actually, other than my bladder being upset at me watching it in the midnight showing, which is probably why everyone was upset about it. Right. Uh, I was like, I had read the books. You know, like 10, 15 years before, some long amount of time, enough to know, okay, well, there's still all this stuff that has to end. So you, obviously, this ending isn't, oh, okay, well, they got to continue to wrap things up. I mean, I think it really speaks to how passionate he was about the project. They spent so much time doing oh, everything. Yeah. But and you so know, so much is accurate. They got they got like original artists that did art for the uh, original Lord of the Rings books that were still alive to help on set and do the set design. I mean, I, th I think the majority of people are never going to appreciate how accurate it was. Oh, or, I, yeah. Or, perhaps, or the like twelve people that do will never stop loving it. Or perhaps you know, I I mean, I I. I love Lord of the Rings. I think it was an incredible accomplishment. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't mind him getting an Academy Award for the third one. You know, mm -hmm. he's sort of like a culmination of everything, whatever. Yeah. But it's sort of like the obsession of accuracy, I think, sort of detracted a little bit in terms of the watchability of them. Like, mm -hmm. they just became so long and yes. every single scene had to be included. I don't know if that's necessarily what it had to be, mm -hmm. but, it, like, it really speaks to how much he loved the series. And yeah. it's, it is thorough. Like, it is thorough. I'll give him props. Yes. That's one of the most thorough things yes. I've ever seen. But I don't know if it's necessarily... You, you think back to something like Frighteners or whatever, mm -hmm. where it's, just, it's much lighter and easier to get oh, yeah. through De dead that alive. like I, I almost I just I think that there might have been something that switched when he started to get into this mindset of like these massive hundred million dollar films yeah. where it's sort of like it's too too much. And I and I feel like maybe because I mean Heavenly Creatures really is this only film up to this point that was because uh, who's the writer on um Frighteners? Was it him? It's him and Fran Walsh. Again. Okay, yeah. So, the two of them. so, I mean, Heavenly Creatures is really, at this point, the only thing he's dealing with that has any kind of basis other than his mm. own creation mm -hmm. that isn't sure. just entirely thought up on sure. his own. And so I feel like there's that... And, and Heavenly Creatures, he was so accurate about, and that was, you know, they love the, the accuracy of it, like, in some sense, well, played to it, whether you knew it or about it or not. So I think that maybe he got a little bit more like, oh, well, I can't do whatever I want. I can't have... A, not a cut missing from my original screenplay. Well, like, no, you so make many me, people to please. You make me think um, maybe there's something to do with the Tolkien estate that he they had to have a certain amount of authenticity or they wouldn't sign off. They on didn't want uh, the movie to really happen, but I think it had either lapsed or they didn't have the control. Right. Over they it did, they didn't have the control. Yeah. Like that, I mean, that's why they did The Hobbit afterwards. Yeah. They didn't have the, that's right. They had the rights, or the, the Hobbit's rights were a little bit more murky, but they had the rights to Lord of the Rings. And Rangers. this just goes to show, because I mean, The Hobbit, not only for being a single book and shorter and much lighter and in we'll story. And we'll get into that whole thing. Uh, you were talking about how like The Hobbit was something you knew of, but not necessarily The Lord of the Rings. I think it maybe goes to show how much that legacy has, before these movies came out, shifted. Because oh, yeah, absolutely. obviously even its popularity. But I mean, my parents were huge. Type, I'm like, my parents' generation, that Lord of the Rings was really, really huge. Mm. And 
as that kind of drifted out, I mean, because, for example, as well as being the only cast and, and crew member to have met J.A.R. Tolkien face-to-face, -face, Christopher Lee, <laughs> the old, one of the oldest right, cast there, members yeah. on there, uh, was also the first person to cast the trilogy, which I think is interesting, hmm. because his extensive knowledge of the books, actually. That's cool. He would visit the makeup department and often give tips about the facial designs of the monsters. But, I mean, you got the oldest, the, one of the oldest cast members in the movie is, like, the only person who has any, like, full-on, as far as, like, actors, full-on legitimacy with J.R.R. Tolkien, and even that's probably very light. So yeah. he, he tried to, I think what he did is it was like, oh, it was clearly beyond Peter Jackson's actual generation, slightly, sure. even if it influenced him as a child, and I think he tried to kind of recapture a lot of that by making it so accurate and wanting to pay so much tribute to it. But I, I do agree that even though they're fun, I still have not sat down and watched all the extended editions day, to this day. Because... It's it's such an endeavor. I'm like, do I really... I know what happens. Do I really want to watch a four-hour movie to get 45 new minutes, you know? like. And you could, I mean, watch two regular movies in that time, too. Yeah. So. I could watch, like, two seasons of most show, TV shows that I'm into. Yeah. Because I watch British shows a lot, but... And it's, it's sort of funny, though, because, I mean, it's not just those films, though, because the mm -hmm. next one we're going to talk about, King Kong, yes. same sort of thing happens there, is mm -hmm. that it's, I mean, he's so, I mean, obviously, King Kong is a beloved yes. classic film that it has been redone before, mm -hmm. but the original is Never so... Never as success, successful as the no, original. No, the original is such an iconic film yeah. that's sort of like almost a wild idea to want to take on such this mm, iconic mm -hmm. film that only the dude who had just done something that seemed impossible yeah. to do would be like, fuck it, I'm doing King mm -hmm. Kong. And, you know, I'm not going to say that I like his version better than the original. Like, there's something about the original that oh, I just yeah. like. It's just so... It's relatively timeless. It's timeless, but it seems so appropriate to the time it was made at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like, the way it was done yeah. is just so perfect in its execution. And Faye Ray's a way better damsel in distress than Naomi Watts. Yeah, well, that's, Sorry, that's, Naomi that's, Watts. that's a problem in and of itself. But, like, <laughs> I think his execution of it in terms of, like, visual effects and mm -hmm. all that stuff very well done. Like, he yeah. was right. You know, he was able to do the visual yes. effects and do it excellent. But there's an element of just, like, the spirit of King Kong mm. that I felt like didn't really transition. Yeah. And when you... Like, there's a 30-minute sequence where he fights with T-Rexes. <laughs> like, very well done. Very cool action sequence. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things that, like, I'm just like, I don't know if I need to see this. <laughs> like, we could... This film is three hours long. I don't know if I need a 30-minute T-Rex action sequence. Yeah. And it sort of, it sort of became more about the digital effects spectacle and less about sort of this story of Kong. And that sort yeah. of was a little bit of the turn and I, off for I me. I think the problem with that was that he wanted to make it bef right after the Frighteners. Oh, interesting. But Universal saw that Godzilla and Mighty Joe mm -hmm. Young would be released mm -hmm. the same year and they pulled the plug on it. And so instead he moved to the Lord of the Rings. Uh, using uh, the ghost effects he developed for King Kong, which may I mean we never we didn't really speak about Andy Serkis as Gollum. Yes, obviously a huge part in Lord of the Rings. Yes, and uh, Andy Serkis, who I mean you would mm -hmm. you talk about like Doug Jones and Guillermo del Toro oh, yeah. being sort of like these pairs of mm -hmm. like inspiration and director like. Andy Serkis is that for yes. Peter Jackson, like because he, he had a hundred and thirty-two sensors attached just to his face. So he could get every facial exp expression for Kong, yeah. yeah, to capture to show Kong's face. So, and it's just like I mean, I, I don't think it, Andy Serkis just is a monkey now. I think you should yeah. just admit that he is a. Full he, he's a, he's a great actor too, though. If you want yep. to see a good film, see Death of a Superhero, which is great. Or great. Birkin Hare, if you like yeah. Seven Peg. No, yeah. but it, I mean King Kong. I don't ne I don't necessarily dislike it. I, mm -hmm. I think there are things. I mean, I'm not a fan of Amy Watts. Yeah. Adrian Brody's okay. I actually like Jack Black in sort of the serious role as mm -hmm. sort of like the, the. He didn't wear any makeup for the film because he heard a fake rumor that Clint Eastwood never wore makeups in any of these films, so he decided not to for the movie. All right, interesting. I, I want to. A part of me feels like Jack Black was like, "I'm making a movie where I'm not playing a dumbass. Mm -hmm. I should care about it." And then someone told him that, and he was like, "Done. Yeah. That'll legitimize my acting role." <laughs> I just I like like I like the idea the relationship between Andaro and King Kong, mm -hmm. and I felt like that just became a little bit more just about the special effects in Peter yes. Jackson's version. That's that was my only major qualm with it. Like I, I would agree with that. I, I I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just he became just so thing. he became so 
like obsessed with mm-hmm. CGI. And, and I mean, it effects. was another one of those things where it's like he was really into it. He owned a lot of original Kong, uh, original King Kong memorabilia that he actually mm-hmm. used in the film. And I mean, he went to great lengths to recreate things. He like bought a crappy boat and had people overhaul it to turn it into like the era appropriate boat. I mean, you know, guy does his homework. Problem is, I think when he he's like a crazy master student who gets so into doing his homework that he loses sight of his thesis. Which is, I mean, which is unfortunate because his earlier work was much more sort of about the fun, yeah. sort of experience the of the mind film. of and Peter just, Jackson. And it's just like everything now feels like he has to pack every single little yep. possible second into yep. it because he feels like he's leaving something out. Which so. is interesting because his next project that we're going to talk about, he try- decided to make some changes and, and it didn't go so well, well for him. The Lovely Bones we're talking yes. about here. And this is the, the novel from Anne Siebold about a girl who's raped and murdered mm-hmm. and sort of looks down from heaven as her family sort of copes with yes. the aftermath of that. And there are a couple things about this film that immediately pop out to me. Number one, I hadn't read the book before I saw the movie. Correct. Same and way. the trailer was awful for this yes. movie. Like the trailer we've spoken about before. I the think trailer for, I was one of the Mark like, Wahlberg? Yeah, I think so. Mark Wahlberg and it also had um Stanley Tucci, but they made mm-hmm. Stanley Tucci the Look most like, yeah. clear child rapist <laughs> yeah. I've ever seen. It's sort of like <laughs> Nobody is possibly yeah. gonna fall he's for balding. It. He's got creepy mustache. Like if I saw that guy on my street, I'd be yeah. like, "That is clearly a guy who's gonna be yeah. doing some child rape and murder." Like he's clearly <laughs> a sketchy character. But even beyond that, like of all the possible films you can make, mm-hmm. the story about a girl who's raped and murdered, and yeah, like that, like you'd have to put a gun to my head. To make me want to yeah. make that film like that, and just... you know he didn't. You know it had the bo- original book had a lot of gra- the, the graphic rape in it, and he chose not to show that because he didn't want to scar the young actress playing it. Who sure, so Ronan. Yeah, which is interesting because Alice Siebold said that she wanted an unknown actress for the role of um, Susie Salmon, Salmon, but uh, and after. Sure, how I can never Shursa. say Shursa. It rhymes with the nurse show. That's right. After Shursa Ronan's uh, was cast for the film. Uh, she then got nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting mm-hmm. a- Actress for Atonement. So I wonder if Alice Siebold was upset about that or happy about that. <laughs> the ironic thing about this is Stanley Tucci was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Huh. Lost to Christoph Waltz for Inglorious Bastards. Uh, but that's, that I would sense. I would not want to make this. You'd ha- you'd have to force me to make this film. I just mm-hmm. I cannot see. Yeah, and I think I think it. its lack of success probably goes to show why he shouldn't have. Maybe. Yeah. Well, that brings us to this Friday, mm-hmm. uh, December fourteenth. We're talking yes. The Hobbit, an unexpected journey. Mm-hmm. This is obviously the return to Middle Earth yes. for Peter Jackson. For those who are unfamiliar with the original Hobbit source material, yes. it actually chronologically takes place mm-hmm. before the later. Bilbo, Lord the older Hobbit from the first movie, this Ian is his Holm, story. You remember? Yeah. Um, who actually returns in the new one? Mm. I have seen The Hobbit. That's right. I have seen it in forty-eight frames per second. Ooh. I will do it spoiler-free in our discussion, okay. but. Um, Ian Holm returns a little bit in the beginning of the movie okay. as a return. In terms of uh, 48 frames per second, the best way I can describe it is it's like the LCD TVs with 120 hertz mm, refresh rate. Those if, ones are always if, on display at Fred Meyer. Yeah, it feels like you're watching a play. Hmm. Like it, it sort of separates. I mean, the 3D seems much more authentic. Oh. It sort of separates the people from the background much more. Interesting. But. In particular, like the CGI feels like it's much more identifiable mm. what's fake and what's real. Like so, it it sort of makes it feel much more theatrical, I see. but not in the sense of like movie theatrical, as in play theatrical. And I'm not I'm not a fan of it. Like I want to go back and rewatch it in just a like regular 2D screening because it actually sort of was distracting to me while huh. watching. But I you know I it I have such mixed feelings about this because I feel like I feel like at first. I, like everybody else, thought, of course, Peter Jackson should do The Hobbit. And then mm. there took years where it was oh, bounced around. And bankruptcy he, didn't help. Yeah, and he said no. The rights and the weren't. Thing, there was just so yeah, many. Del Toro was doing it Yes, there's so many things that just didn't play out, and it wasn't right. And then it was like, finally fell back to Peter Jackson. And by the time it finally fell back to him, I'd almost by that time become uninterested in him being the director. Because by this time, it's been long enough that I feel it might be better to have... A different voice. A, or something. A, a different voice, a different tone. I mean, th- that didn't hurt the Harry Potter films to have different directors on the different films. Well, the films. last, like, last four or something were all David Yates. Yeah, but I mean, look at Alfonso Cuaron, Cuaron's, yeah. and that was, like, the best one in the series. So, I mean, I, I, I kind of was 
uh, unhappy with him coming back? Well, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, I, as I said, I, I was a fan of The Hobbit growing up, so mm -hmm. I didn't have any investment in The Lord of the Rings. I'm much more interested in sort of The Hobbit being made into a movie. Mm -hmm. That being said, like... The first film in this is series is two hours and 40 minutes, which is Oof. 20 minutes shorter than the shortest of the Lord of the Rings films. Um, as you mentioned before, it was only one book, The yes. Hobbit was, versus three for mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings, though they're both stretched to yes. three films. Um, uh -huh. Watching the movie, like, it definitely struck me, like, I want, I want to sort of compare the pacing of Fellowship to mm. The Hobbit because it felt... Very comprehensive and very thorough, but it, yes. I felt like it de definitely could have been sped up. Whereas, like, you know, I, I, don't I mean, know. even though they're long and drawn out, I'm going to say right now, if you've even if you've read Lord of the Rings and you're a fan of those books, there's too much traveling. And J.R. Tolkien still wrote The Hobbit, so there's still parts Did that. Did he write it after The Lord of the Rings? No, I, I think okay. I don't think I think so. It was he wrote before. so if there was enough traveling in The Hobbit for you, then yeah, he wrote. But the I'm Lord just of... saying. But I'm just saying more than the fact that it's like, you know, J. J.R. Tolkien's source material, while interesting and comprehensive and fascinating, also needed an editor. He needed someone to tell him to I cut think, some stuff down. I think Richard Kelly is proof perfect that, you know, not everyone needs to just do whatever they want. Yeah, and I just, you know... You South Lane Tales is what happens. Sometimes you need... Or the director's cut of Donnie Darko. Um, yeah. Sometimes you need somebody to step back and, and put the foot in. And, and I think what happened is that everybody got so focused on the fact that The Hobbit would only ever happen good with Peter Jackson at the helm that by the time they gave it back to him... Everybody was like, oh, well, just, yeah, just, he did the Lord of the Rings, and we all said he couldn't, and look how, look how good it was, the, and so I just, the, I don't know. The other thing about The Hobbit I was thinking about, in terms of, like, you know, just the characters, that one of the main driving forces of The Hobbit is Thorin of Oakenshield, mm -hmm. the main sort of, like, guy. Yeah. And he's a dick. Like, let's be real. Mm -hmm. Like, he's yeah. not a good guy. No, not per at se. all. And he is one of the... Whereas, like, pretty much the majority of the characters in The Lord of the Rings uh, yes. were good guys. It's true. They're all doing this for the good of something. Whereas, this is purely driven by his greed, yeah. essentially. Like, he wants to reconquer his homeland. Mm -hmm. He wants to get his treasure back. Yep. And... You know, I, I, I don't know if that's going to have a negative... Not a, It's not a huge issue with the first film. Like, mm -hmm. it's it's a little bit of, a, like, a, a, a challenge, mm -hmm. perhaps. But, like, Later as it on, goes on, yeah. as you're going to, like, <laughs> hour nine or whatever yeah, of the series, yeah. is that going to be something that's just going to be a little grating mm -hmm. as time goes mm -hmm. on? I don't know. But, the, I mean, the, the visuals are very much in line with what you'd expect. Yeah. Perhaps even a little bit more... Um, comedic not not in the sense it's mm. funny but sort of like over the top I like see. there's one scene where they're like sliding down the side of a hill on like part of a bridge or whatever that's <laughs> like really are we watching this like it's a little <laughs> cheesy i i just i don't know like i mean i'm not saying that the film is bad i enjoyed the film mm. it's pretty much more of the same yeah, but that's my problem but it's just sort of like... A lot more of the same. I, I just, I don't know. Like, I would like something, to, as you said, I would like something to differentiate mm -hmm. this from the the Lord of the Rings. And I, I don't know if we're going to get that I besides mean, 48 frames per like, second. Honestly, even, that's the thing is like, even, even it being a single contained story compared to the Lord of the Rings done in one movie done exactly the same like he did the Lord of the Rings would have been a departure from the Lord of the Rings because The Hobbit is a much faster single character driven story. And so it's like, why, why, why break that up into three? Why make the short, st the, the the fast story well, be long and drawn out? I, I mean, I have to look back and sort of compare. But as I recall, I think the Hobbit has the advantage of a uh, more Gandalf. I think mm. there's more Gandalf in it than Lord of the Rings. He, mm -hmm. he disappears for a long stretch of yeah. the time, Lord of the Rings. And two, um, B whatever I said before. <laughs> um, I think I like Bilbo better than Frodo. Frodo's a little too vanilla for me. No, that was always the hardest thing for me, reading because I read The Hobbit as a kid, and it's like, what, after the excitement of Bilbo Baggins and The Hobbit, Frodo seems He's like... kind of vanilla. He seems like a, like a background character that just f exists while all the interesting characters do things. Yeah. And I, 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 I don't know. I also think, and this is probably not anything new that no one out there hasn't heard before, but I don't get the three movies i can you you know what one long one one long one i can i could totally i would be on board and i would say even if it was ridiculously long people should shut up right two 
Maybe. Maybe if there were two decent, like maybe two two hours or under two hours, I could see that I maybe. I could see two films, and, I think, you know, is what I would say. Ended at a good solid note kind of thing. Like, But three, because you know why I think three is unnecessary besides the fact that it's three out of one book when the other was three out of three books? Because they've, they're using stuff from like appendixes and the Cimmerillion yeah. and other stuff. So they're literally, they're literally by the third movie going to be grasping at straws for material because they don't have enough for a third one. Yeah. I Why mean, make a third one? I, th I think <clears throat> for me it would have been two films would have been a solid number. I th yeah. I think that seems appropriate in terms of just the amount of content. Yeah, the I amount think. of content and the extended editions, the Lord of the Rings. Like clearly he's got, he can do it in depth and it's got enough there. Two yeah. films I could see because any of the single Lord of the Rings movies with all their errata, are long enough to be two films. And, I mean, just... I, I mean, I guess the, the main advantage for The Lord of the Rings is that you have more Gollum mm -hmm. than The Hobbit. I don't... More, I, mean, I think more of a diversity of characters. Not but that I dislike the dwarves, but also, they're all dwarves. Yeah. I mean, but you have, like, tons of orcs and all sorts of... I mean, there's true. plenty of stuff yeah. going on. But the other Trolls. thing is, I like Smog better. It's sort mm -hmm. of like an end capper, whereas Lord of the Rings really sort of, like... It's just, like, another big battle, really. Yeah. Like, Smog, I feel like, is a great sort of True. main villain. And then you have, like, the whole battle after mm -hmm. Smog, yes. um, which is the dragon in the movie. Yes, voiced by Benedict Cumberbatch, yep. Sherlock. Yep. Um, so, I I mean, I, I, I'm i optimistic about it. I'm curious to see what happens with mm -hmm. it. I, I'm, I'm not so much in love with the 48 frames per second, but, you know, it's more of the same, really. I don't really think there's that much. I, I, think, what, I think the sad part is that the only new exciting thing that Peter Jackson did for this film is the one that people care about the least, which is the 48 frames per second. I think everything else that could have been new, interesting, done creative, done well, was basically just rehashed like Lord of the Rings. I, I will say I understand what he was trying for, to put you more in the action of the mm -hmm. experience, which I appreciate, but it just... It doesn't, the way it looks, it doesn't do that to me. It just distracts me. It's like I'm watching them act it out as sort mm -hmm. of like a rehearsal instead of a minute, uh, a movie. Like it feels like it takes away sort of some of that cinematic element that mm. I love about films. Gotcha. And I, it, like, I understand they want to put you inside the action, but there's like this chasm between cinematic and that, that yes. I, like we're not crossing yet. We're somewhere yeah. in the middle and it just, it feels a little weird to me. So, I mean, it's, it's 3D essentially. It's another type of 3D gimmick it's hey here's another thing that it's better that 3d be i'll get i will say that about it i mean there it does feel 3d but it's not like it just it just proves that maybe 3d is not what we're supposed I, to do I've we need those little years. vr virtual reality helmets or whatever but anyway brain slugs brain slugs it comes out this friday the mm -hmm. 14th of december you next can join two us come out the next two christmases yeah you can join us uh next week for our dvd rundown mm -hmm. of the 18th mm -hmm. and as always you can find us at mcguffinpodcast.com twitter.com slash mcguffincast facebook.com slash mcguffinpodcast mm -hmm. phone number 323-761-9842 all those outlets to tell us how wrong or right we are about exactly probably about how right we are because we're probably we're yeah. right. uh we're on itunes mm -hmm. blip.tv yes Miro, Roku. Yes, check in and get glue and get some sticky badges all over your face, <laughs> running down your neck. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. It's don't even try to bite the side of Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.